Hello, everyone, and welcome back once again to Nervous Breakdowns with G, the podcast in which I, Gino, apply my vast knowledge of all things to answering your questions. Now, who am I kidding? I don't have vast knowledge of all things, but I do have some knowledge. I uh, am a licensed counselor, nationally certified counselor. I have master's degrees in counseling and clinical psychology and over 10 years of clinical experience in the mental health field. And uh, I don't know everything, but I am trying to learn it along with you guys as I answer these questions. As I do this uh, podcast, I'm going to be researching the questions, trying to put them together in a way that makes sense, and breaking it down for you, just like the name of the podcast says. So, um, if you have some questions, I might as well give you my contact information right up front. Uh, you can email me at breakdownswithg at gmail.com. You can uh, get me at breakdownswithg on Twitter. Uh, I have a Tumblr page as well, uh, breakdownswithg.tumblr.com. And lastly, uh, you can get my YouTube channel. Also, this uh, uh, podcast is available on iTunes and on Stitcher. So this week, I wanted to take a look at a question that was given to me by a friend of a friend who wanted to know, why is it that people can't ever save for retirement even though they know they should? So, you know, I'm still trying to uh, pin down my, my kind of creative process. I'm still trying to learn how I, I, I how to, you know, what, what is the process by which I come up with the show and come up with the material. And uh, honestly, I struggled with the last podcast, and I think it was because I didn't really, I didn't really love the subject matter. So I really kind of chewed on this one for, f- for quite a few days, and uh, I actually really came up with some, some pretty interesting thoughts about it, and I, I felt the need to share it more quickly. So I'm, I'm turning this one out a little more fat quickly than I have the last ones. Um, but as I thought about the question, why people don't save money, it occurred to me that m- many of the lifestyle problems that we have these days can be related to an inability to, to delay gratification. You know, we always uh, uh, make choices that, that feel good now, but at the cost of some pain later on. And this doesn't just relate to saving money. It relates to dieting, for example. I mean, um, why should I delay or put off eating something that's delicious now so that I could lose weight later? I mean, I know intellectually we know why that is. If you have health benefits and the, the way you look, your, your general fitness and the way your clothes fit, all those things. But we, we always do this, though, right? I mean, when faced with an immediate choice to, to eat something, you know, fast food or candy, uh, it re- it's really hard in the moment to say no to that um, in the interest of a long-term goal. And I kind of see saving money as being very similar in the sense that if I want to buy something now, why am I going to put that off? Why am I going to uh, delay that for something that's abstract in the future, for, for, for financial security? What does that even mean? Um, I've also noticed that this trend exists in my mental health practice. Um, whenever I see clients that come to me with anxiety, particularly, um, they're, they're socially anxious. They don't want to go out. They feel like, uh, it's uncomfortable for them to leave their homes. What they're constantly doing is, is choosing short term comfort, the, the comfort of not being, you know, in their minds judged by other people at the expense of their long term comfort at the, at the pain of, you know, not being able to socialize, not being able to leave their homes. And we spend a lot of time in therapy trying to uh, work this out. Um, so I, I'm going to talk in, in, in very general terms about delaying gratifications today because I think it can apply to all of these topics. And I think it applies to a lot of the lifestyle problems that we see. Um, I'm going to be looking at the barriers, at some of the research on the topic, um, and eventually coming up with some tips that, that may be able to help us out. So... Delaying gratification is something that's actually uh, considered to be pretty uniquely human. Um, dogs don't often delay gratification. You never see a dog turn down a treat in the hopes of getting more treats later. Uh, and so we see delaying gratification as being one of our higher functions. So a lot of studies that look at delayed gratification really compare us to our closest relatives, which are chimpanzees and uh, another type of chimp called a, a, a Bono, bonobo, bonobo. I don't know. I, I don't know how to pronounce it, but it's B O N O B O. Um, and I found one interesting study where they looked at uh, delaying gratification between twi- chimps and humans. They did a control, so they took uh, a food treat, one treat versus three, 
uh, and universally, the chimps, with, with, when there was no delay at play, the chimps and the humans would pick three. I would rather have three treats than one. So as, as long as I have to wait the same amount of time for both, I'm going to pick more. When they started to introduce the delay to um, the, the more treats, so in other words, I could have one treat now, or I could have three treats after two minutes. These German researchers actually found that chimps are better than humans at delaying a food reward, that the chimps, more often than the humans, would take three after a short wait, where humans would almost always pick the one. So delaying gratification is not so uniquely human as you might think. Where humans pull ahead from chimps is when the thing starts to become more abstract. Money, for example. When it comes to money, humans will always delay gratification because we have an understanding that, that more money is better than less money. Uh, for example, almost everyone would take $300 next week versus $10 now. Makes sense, right? Certainly, $300 is more than $10. So we will delay our gratification in order to get the larger reward. Things start to get a little fuzzy when the numbers and the time are closer. So $300 next week versus $10 now, easy. $12 tomorrow versus $10 today. That's where it starts to get a little hazy because the $12 is not so significantly more than the 10 where the, the delay makes it worth it. And in those situations, people tend to take the sooner reward. So we're seeing lots of different studies that look at how people choose the types of rewards they want. And these things have direct impact on, in general, our decision making when it comes to food, when it comes to money, saving money, for example. Are we looking at something as clear as the $10 versus $300 when we look at saving for retirement? Or is it more like I can put away a, what seems like a lot of money today for what seems like not that much money in 20 years. Um, it, it gets a little hazy. I mean, I think some, some financial people might be able to, to answer the question better, but it seems like given the length of time and the amount of money you actually end up with, it's, it might be closer to the $10 today versus $12 tomorrow argument. Um, so um, we look at delaying gratification. Now, let, let me be clear. Food is different in most cases. Um, Food has such a strong evolutionary uh, meaning that almost everyone will choose to, to, to eat more now. Um, for every animal, for every creature except human beings, food is really uncertain. It's, it's such a dumb move in the wild to pass up a certain food source that you have now in the hopes of a food source that may not exist later that we have actually been evolved to... to jam our faces with food when we get it. When we see food, we eat it all because we don't know when we're going to get it next. And the couple of thousands of years of civilized um, behavior that we've had have not overcome this yet. So overeating is really something where we're fighting our nature. Now, I want to point that out, and I'm going to keep pointing that out. When we talk about delaying gratification, in many ways we're fighting our nature. We're It's an uphill battle. We're... we're, we're trying to go against the grain that evolution has set up for us because evolution did not prepare us for things that are intrinsic in, in, in civilized society like having an abundance of things or living a long time or uh, money, which is an abstract thing that we were never, we were never created to handle. Um, so evolution in general favors taking immediate rewards against long-term rewards. Um, I also found that self-control in general is the choice of a more valuable delayed reward versus a faster reward that's less valuable. Uh, so self-control is not something that's necessarily um, evolutionarily adaptive. When they look at people's tendencies to make decisions, they, they, a lot of kind of cool uh, research uh, uh, tools have been developed. Uh, the, 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 the one that I've looked at extensively is called the Iowa Gambling Task. And in this task, what happens is the, the researchers are faced with, I'm sorry, the research participants are faced with four decks of cards. Uh, they don't know what's in the decks, but they know that um, 
the, the idea of the game is to end up with the highest value. Two of the decks of cards have low rewards and low risks. So when they pull from those two decks, they're going to get a small number plus or a small number minus, uh, and they add that to their total. When they pull from the two other decks, they have high risk and high reward. It is always advantageous to take the low risk, low reward deck in this game because your, your totals don't move as much. Um, and by and large, when people are faced with these decks, even though they don't know which are which, they tend to gravitate towards the, the lower risk, lower reward cards, with some exceptions. People that are pathological gamblers, for example, even though they find out that the certain decks have high risk and high reward, um, they will gravitate towards those and end up with poorer outcomes. The same thing is true of overeaters. Overeaters tend to uh, gravitate towards the decks that are worse for them. Uh, and it, it kind of makes sense con- considering the, the, the behavior patterns and the lives of those types of people, of uh, pathological gamblers and overeaters, is that they tend to make the same mistakes over and over again. So when we're looking at, when we're, we're looking at the question of why don't we save, the answer seems pretty obvious. We don't save because it's kind of against our nature. It's against our nature to forego something now for something abstract that's later. So if your goal is to be a better saver, to be a better dieter, to be a less anxious person, you really have to take an honest look at yourself. You have to be honest about whether or not you have self-control. Because if you can look at yourself and say you don't have self-control, that's not necessarily that doesn't necessarily mean that you can't have savings or you can't diet. You just have to take some extra steps. It doesn't make you a bad person. It just impacts kind of the, 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 the rules of the, of the field. We have to make different tactics to overcome your shortcomings. Um, you have to recognize that human nature is uh, working against you when it comes to making some of these smart financial decisions and smart dieting decisions. So, uh, looking specifically at delaying gratification, we find that there's a lot of things that we can do to, to make the waiting more tolerable. There's been a lot of studies from the 70s by these two guys named uh, Walter Mischel and Eb Ebison. Uh, and what they looked at was children. They, they examined children in a variety of situations, and they said, hey, kids, uh, I have some rewards for you. I have either one piece of candy that you can have now, or I have these three pieces of candies that you can have after you wait a little while. And they examined a lot of different factors related to what made that wait longer or shorter. For example, they found that almost universally, distraction worked. So having the reward visible inevitably made the wait time, the amount of time the children were wait, willing to wait less. Um, so if you gave a kid a piece of candy and you set him about a task, you know, you have to do two math problems. If the candy was visible, the kids would eventually take the lesser reward that they didn't have to wait for because they couldn't fight the, the temptation of having the candy. When they distracted the children or covered up the reward, they found that the kids were able to complete almost any task they gave them. Uh, so how can we apply this to ourselves? Think about situations where you um, have to fight temptation. If you're trying to save money, uh, you probably shouldn't go window shop at the mall. You know that if you go and you see the immediate reward of that uh, pair of sneakers you wanted or that handbag or that piece of jewelry or whatever, video game, TV, once you're faced with the immediate concrete object, that's always going to win out over the abstract long-term goal of financial security. In other words... You shouldn't go into the mall if you're trying to save money. A lot of these things seem seem uh, pretty basic, pretty simple, but they're things that I don't think that we follow through with a lot of times. Same thing for dieting. If you're trying to lose weight and you're trying to stay on a, a particular regimen, you know, I'm not going to get into the specifics of uh, low-carb diets or whatever fad is out now, but if you're trying to stick with a particular uh, plan of dieting, you shouldn't go into fast food restaurants. You shouldn't have junky food in your house. Your human nature is not going to allow you to resist those things. Now, I'm sure some of you are going to 
email me or say, hey, you know, I can I can handle this stuff. And, and if you can, then you are really uh, an amazing person. But research shows that most people don't have the ability to delay gratification uh, in all times. So if you're trying to be successful, you should really attempt to, to, to set up a situation where success is easier. You don't want to have these obstacles to your success that we can be that we can avoid. The same two researchers also found that reminding yourself constantly of the goal is actually counterproductive. You know, a lot of times when we um, tell ourselves that we want to achieve, if I want to buy an expensive item, uh, I may jot a little note to myself in my in my bathroom mirror, reminding myself to go for that or to to do this or that thing that's going to lead me towards my goal. And these researchers actually find that 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 seems to be counterproductive, that distracting yourself altogether um, is a better way to handle being more successful at your goal. So, for example, if you're having a dieting goal, you should do things that are not food related uh, or you should remind yourself that you have uh, different types of uh, I don't even know, but uh you should just try to distract yourself, not make your life be about the diet or the saving money because you find that the, the self-control deteriorates. Your ability to delay gratification deteriorates the more you remind yourself of the goal that you're working for. Seeing the reward in this, people's, in this uh, study uh, with children actually destroyed their ability to control themselves. So, my research found several kind of basic ideas that, that we're working with here. The first one is that evolution and human nature work against us. There are very few things that we grapple with in civilized society that we're prepared for in the wild. You know, we have an overabundance of high calorie, low nutritional value foods that are really bad for us. At some point in our in our history, in our evolutionary history, uh, it was probably good to eat things that were fatty or sweet because they were pretty rare you know if you found a sweet fruit or a, a plant that meant it was probably pretty ripe and it was probably pretty good to eat uh, or an animal that you killed that was fatty was more than likely pretty healthy it might have been a good thing to eat and you would seek that out in the future as opposed to now where uh, fat and sweet is uh, overabundant and they're horrible for you our bodies are not made to process it in the in the quantities that we eat them so our human nature works against us in civilized society. Um, the second thing is our, our human nature works against us when it comes to concrete versus abstract rewards. When we're faced with a choice where we can have a thing now or an idea later, we tend to choose the thing now. Uh, once again, this probably is an adaptation from when things were pretty scarce, uh, especially with, with things like financial security. If I have some money in my pocket and there's a thing that I want, a TV, it's really hard to, to justify not buying that thing if I have the money or even if I don't, you know, in, in the credit uh, card days that we live in. But uh, when, when my long-term goal is an abstract thing like financial security or comfort in my old age, um, because people didn't live very long for, mo for much of human history, we're not really designed to think more than you know, even a few, few months or a few years ahead. Um, so our human nature is really kind of hurting us when it comes to these long-term goals that we talk about. So this doesn't mean that we are slaves to that. It doesn't mean that we can't overcome that and achieve the goals that we, um, that we're, 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 we know intellectually are good for us. We just have to do things that kind of grease the wheels and get us there a little easier. Um, things like avoiding temptation because we understand that concrete things overcome abstract things if you have a goal try to avoid as much as possible putting yourself around a concrete thing that might derail you um, once again if you are on a diet uh, the best thing you can do is to get rid of anything in your in your home that's going to take you off your diet if you're trying to save money don't go look at the items that you might normally buy because chances are you're going to buy them while you're there um Another thing you might want to do to, to help yourself out is to automate where possible. Um, for example, when it comes to retirement uh, planning, almost all of us through our employers have some ability to set aside some money. 
put it in a 401k or 403b or whatever your, your employer offers you. Do that. You, you're not limited to the amount that they tell you, you, you know, they'll match you. You can always put in more or uh, talk to somebody at your bank and try to invest in, in some other way. Have them pull even more money out of your um, account. My wife, for example, uses a way to save. Well, I don't even know how it works, but it automatically takes out some portion of every time we use our ATM card. And every once in a while, we have a few extra bucks. Um, it's a really painless way to save money where you don't even think about it. And because it's automated, you don't have the opportunity to, to not do that. Uh, when it comes to, to making good choices, try to put in as many decision points as possible between you and a problem behavior. Um, if you have a, somebody that's with you, engage them to be like kind of your partner, your confederate, to where they can step in and say, hey, you sure you want to do that? Or are you, um, do you want to eat that thing that, that's not on your diet? Uh, if you don't have snack food in your house, every step that it takes for you to eat snack food is a decision point. Do you want to get in that car and drive to the fast food place? Do you want to go inside the fast food place? When you're there, you're going to eat the fattiest thing or a more healthy choice. The more decision points you have, the more opportunities you have to um, override this uh, this human nature that we have. But in general, the idea is that we have to use our, our intellect to really, as much as possible, increase our chances for success. When we use our intellect as opposed to our human nature or our emotion, we really can, can set up an environment where we can achieve the goals we want to achieve. Once again, I, I talk about this a lot in my, in my clinical practice. When, when I see clients who come in, the vast majority of them have just, for whatever reason, fallen into a rut where they, where they, they do the comfortable thing all the time. They do the thing that uh, is the easiest or the thing that causes them the least pain. We all do it, but, but when it comes to, to working in mental health, we see people who start to have real bad symptoms and real bad uh, repercussions because of it. And one of the things that I try to engage them on is, you know, how much of a participant do you want to be in your own life? Do you want to just accept that, that things are happening to you the way they are and that this pattern that you have is going to be the pattern you always have? Or do you want to make some decisions that are going to eventually lead you toward a goal that you have? If you're interested in finding work, what's a step that you can take? The very first step is go, you know, find a job application. Just pick it up. Don't even fill it out. Just do the first step, which is to pick it up and take a look at it. And when, when we start to engage people and start to give them some, some ownership and some power over their lives, we start to see that people f start feeling better. We had this, this backwards idea sometimes that in order to feel better, let me rephrase that, in order to do X, Y, or Z, I need to feel A, B, or C. So in order for me to um, go to the gym, it would be as if I was saying, in order for me to go to the gym, I need to feel better. In order for me to um, go date somebody, I need to feel better about myself. And in reality, it seems to me that the opposite is true, that it's the things that we do that give us a sense of how we feel about ourselves. So if I'm interested in losing weight and going to the gym, or I'm sorry, if I'm interested in losing weight and feeling better about myself, maybe going to the gym and getting in, in shape in spite of how I feel about it is the way to do that. You know, maybe if I want to feel better about myself, I should go introduce myself to some people and see how they react. Or if I want to feel more independent, I should go get a job and try to earn some money for myself. Uh, again, if there's a lot of people out there that have real clinical problems, and, and, and if you do, if you're one of those people, I encourage you to, to seek out a counselor. Uh, but I'm, I'm just generally talking about some of the backwards ways that we think and that Sometimes the way to overcome our bad feelings is to actually do some of the things that we know intellectually are good for us. I think the same thing holds true for saving money, for uh, dieting, all these things where our human nature tells us that we should do the more immediate and less good thing require us to have some forethought and to set up parameters in our lives that help us do the more long-term and more smart thing in the long run in conclusion the reason people don't save money 
and the reason they don't diet and whatever else is good for you that we're supposed to do. The reason why we get wrapped up, especially as Americans and a lot of these lifestyle and health issues that are, are chronic and related to our diets and our inactivity is because our human nature actually works against us in many ways. And if you're interested in having better health, whether that's financial or, or, or physical or better looks, you have to use your brain and set up a set of parameters that takes into account our tendencies to not want to do some, a lot of important things for us. If you do those things, I think success is inevitable. So thank you guys very much for listening. Uh, I hope that you guys had as much fun listening to this as I had making it. Um, you can reach out to me. Again, I, I take your questions and I answer them, guys. I've, all three episodes have been from questions I've gotten from friends and uh, from, from listeners. And uh, please keep bringing them. I want to hear them. My uh, email address is breakdownswithg at gmail.com. My Twitter is at breakdownswithg. My uh, Tumblr is breakdownswithg.tumblr.com. You can subscribe to my YouTube channel, please, at breakdownswithg. Uh, and uh, download this thing. Tell your friends about it. Please share it. I, I don't make any money off this thing, but I do get a little, a little kick out of seeing my download numbers go up. So please, if you have some friends that you think can benefit, give it to them. Thank you.